it's time to funk. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the history of microtransactions, how they started and how they turned so predatory to the point that people are avoiding them and trying to get them banned, putting them in the same category as casino gambling. So what are microtransactions? Broadly speaking, microtransactions are the additional payment in video games, also known as downloadable content or DLC. DLCs could include additional gameplay such as new levels or different skins for characters and custom armour. It started with companies trying to find a balance and slowly put in more and more smaller transactions such as costumes to get more money out of their audience. And because of how the game industry is using microtransactions, it quickly turned into a derogative term. This quickly made a a noticeable difference between DLC and microtransaction. The main difference being that they can sell DLC such as new levels while still selling microtransactions such as premium in-game currency. Microtransactions have been placed into four categories by Turo University worldwide. In-game currency. This is one of the first forms of microtransaction and the most common to be found in mobile games such as Simpsons Tap Out or Klepto Cats. It consists of fake in-game currency that allows you to buy better or different things. This currency in-game, marketed as the free currency, doesn't do half the stuff that this premium currency does. This premium currency costs 99p for 10 coins, or about £10 for 200 coins. This works well for not letting people keep track of how much they spend in the app, with one person spending two thousand pounds on Candy Crush in one day with the app offering a thousand gold bars for a hundred pounds, making spending a thousand very easy to do without actually realising how much you've spent. Random chance purchases. Random chance purchases are the mystery bag of goodies, like a Kinder Egg without the chocolate or the toy. For two pounds you can get two loot boxes filled with random virtual items for the game such as costumes, voice lines and even dance moves. This is the closest to gambling that microtransactions come to be in. You spend real money to gamble on getting something that you want but most likely won't get because of the chances are so low. But unlike real gambling you're not getting any money in return or like an actual object with the loot boxes once you spend the money it's gone and what makes it even worse is that some games that offer these random chance purchases release a new game every year such as FIFA that you can't transfer these items over from game to game meaning that you have to rebuy these random purchases every year to get what you want in the new game. In-game items In-game items started in free to play games being that they have no cost to play. They will often offer players upgrades such as extra lives or boosts. But now more expensive games are adopting these strategies to their games such as guns, items and other stuff, giving the buyer an advantage in the game. These items are often better than what you can earn for free and they can make the game more easier. This pits players who do not pay for upgrades against those who do giving a clear advantage to people who buy and encouraging people to pay more frequently. Activision, a game developer and one of the biggest abusers of microtransactions, created a program to put a player who doesn't have the item with a second player who does to bait the first player into spending money to get the item without either of the players knowing that they are being manipulated into buying or selling the item. Expiration Mainly used for seasonal events, expiration microtransactions will be active for about two weeks. This short time frame means that players will have to play and play and play the game till they get the things they want or just pay for the items. This mixed with the random chance purchases means that the player has to pay more to get all the items. The worst that I've seen so far is the Apex Legend Iron Crown Collection Axe Event. To get this axe you need all 24 of the rare and legendary items in the event that are hidden in loot boxes. One of the loot boxes costs about 700 in-game currency, that at the cheapest will cost you £8 for a thousand coins. So to get all these timed items with a 7.4% win rate, you will have to spend hundreds to get all the random items, with one of the items costing straight up 3,500 coins. 
that would cost you 32 quid. Yes, you can play the game and level up normally and just do it that way, but the event started on the 13th of August and ending on the 27th of August, only giving people two weeks to complete the event, meaning that people without the free time to play would have to pay at least £138 for the event and this is meant to be one of the free games that you can play and other games do this as well such as Overwatch which you have to pay at least £60 to play and has seasonal events and loot boxes these four types of microtransactions, some mild and some more exploitative, originally started out as a way for developers and publishers to get a bit more money from us. This turned abusive though, as in 2016 there was a seminar called Let's Go Whaling by uh, Tribrid Flare CEO Trollwolf Jern Storm talking about all the ways you can get people to buy microtransactions using behavioural psychology such as offers and scarcity that is the aspirational type that uses people's fear of missing out to get them to buy them. There's also an IKEA effect that is triggered to remind you to do something that leads to an action, then a reward, then an investment. Such as building a table from IKEA or just advancing in one of the games and it just loops around. These methods are also used to get us addicted to what we are doing and to get money out of us in some way, even using social standing to do this. Take Fortnite for example, where there have been reports of kids getting bullied in schools for having default skins in the game leaving a groups of haves and haves not resulting in kids buying skins to fit in this let's go whaling talk shows just how little companies value their customers even the titles dehumanizing to the consumer it's describing the three types of people who buy microtransactions in free-to-play games there's minnow people who spend about one pound or none at all then there's dolphin they spend about five pounds and then finally, you've got the whale. There are people who spend about 20 pounds or more daily. Whales are often people who have a lot of money or children who don't know what they're doing. Or people who easily get addicted to gambling or collecting stuff. But then again, companies don't care who's giving them the money as long as they get the money. Sue, so how did this microtransaction craze start? Well, it started in 2006 when games such as Saints Row and Gears of War came out. But there was one game that got headlines for the wrong reasons. This was Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Released 20th of March, this game got flack for its DLC, when on the 3rd of April, they released Horse Armor. This is just cosmetic armor for the horse that is still being sold for £1.69. This seems trivial with what they're selling now, but in 2006 this was seen as scandalous, but eventually it became normal, seen now with more modern games such as Borderlands 3, they're selling skins for £4. But other than DLC such as cosmetics and extra content, microtransactions didn't evolve in mainstream gaming for a while. Mobile gaming however, a new wave of microtransactions came into the picture. The time saver microtransactions started in games such as Heyday and Farmville. Being able to pay to save time on growing and building things in the game allowed for longer play time. But like with anything, there was certain games that took this to the extreme. Like with Dungeon Keep Mobile where it pesters you to buy gems to skip the wait time that can take days to build a room. Another one of these games is Harry Potter Hogwarts Mystery that allows you to make your own character and complete most of the first year at Hogwarts till about an hour and a half in when you have to use your limited energy and makes you fight some devil snare five times for five energy. So you could just wait till your energy gets refilled but there's a timer that restarts the whole activity when it runs out meaning that you can't naturally refill your energy without buying gems to be able to pass that section. This method gets players invested with the hour of gameplay, making them more inclined to buy the gems to continue the game. Going back to mainstream gaming, in 2011, Ali Noir started with another big money making idea, creating the Season Pass, being that you can buy the Season Pass for around £40 plus £60 for the 
base game, but this usually does make it cheaper than just buying all the DLC separately. Another thing that they slowly bought into mainstream gaming was pre-order bonuses. This is done in several ways. First way, they can give you some stuff for free for pre-ordering it. Then another way is allowing early access to games. And finally, some sort of statue or an exclusive item that you can only get from special edition. But like always, they had to abuse it. Games such as Anthem and Assassin's Creed that got so bad all had to make spreadsheets to figure out what you get with each edition and how many editions you need to buy all of the stuff and some of these editions, some of these editions didn't even come with the actual game, it was just the uh, collectible items. But this was only the start, making even Dead Space 3's Bible resource packs seem reasonable in comparison to what was about to come. The birth of the loot box started small in 2010, only appearing in free to play games such as Team Fortress 2 or Star Trek Online. These mass multiplayer games used loot boxes as a reward for logging in daily and playing the game. This was a good way of doing it being that the game was free and loot boxes were rewards for loyalty. Then EA implemented pack cards into FIFA allowing people to get random footballers to build their online teams. Well this is bad being that there's now an iteration of the game every year but the big boom of loot boxes started in 2016 with the release of Overwatch. On May 24th 2016 Overwatch was released and their usage of loot boxes sort of opened a gateway for other developers. Overwatch's inclusion of loot boxes and spending money on them was well received by the general public being that it didn't give any player an advantage over another and at this time there wasn't any great manipulation techniques to trick people into buying loot boxes but a year later on the 17th of November 2017 EA released Star Wars Battlefront Two. This game was the start of the loot box decline. This game had three types of loot boxes in it. One for Alliance, one for Trooper, and the last one for Starfighters. These three boxes represented the different factions you could play as in the game. And as you'd expect, it got panned by the audience and reviewers for feeling like the microtransactions were the actual core of the game. And the rest of the game was just filler because they had an obligation to make a game. And there were also charging a minimum of £60 to buy the game to start off with. Another game that got into trouble for this was Middle Earth Shadow of War, where it took its key selling feature from the first game, the Orc Hierarchy, and made it so that you could buy better sleeper agents to put into the hierarchy that you could also gather in the normal game, but the ones you'd get in the base game were weaker and generally less effective than the Orcs you could pay money for. Middle Earth Shadow of War was described as killing microtransactions by Jordan Remy from GameSpot in 2018 but luckily with the release of the definitive edition of the game on the 28th of August 2018 they removed the feature making the game better for players. This was definitely the downfall of microtransactions. With more developers building their games around these microtransactions this led the audience to become tired of this concept of the microtransactions leading to some people just straight up avoiding them in future games. Another game that improved with time was the before mentioned Star Wars Battlefront 2. After all the controversy that it went through, EA got bored with it and the developers just remade the game how they wanted, adding more characters, removing the loot boxes and just making it a fun experience for the audience and it's actually turned into a really good game. So with microtransactions getting such a bad reputation, you would have thought that that'd be it, they'd just stop putting them in games, but no, it made money. So publishers just found a way around this. One of the ways they did this was putting them in later on in patches. This was the case for Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled, a remake of a really classic game Crash Team Racing released by Activision June 20th 2019. This game released to high praise from reviewers and players alike, being that it was a fan favourite just updated with modern graphics and a better game engine as an encore to the 2017 Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. The problem with this is that on August 2nd they released an unneeded update to the game that added premium currency. 
the premium currency called Wampa Coins at the cheapest cost £2.39 for 2500 Like most in-game currencies, you can spend this on cosmetic items that don't have any in-game advantages other than just looking nice. But that's not the issue. The issue was that they added this in needlessly 13 days later after all the reviews went out saying that there was no microtransactions in the game and even the game boxes in stores on the back with all the warnings say that it doesn't have in-game purchases so people who buy games that are looking for them without microtransactions could pick up this game and find out that they were lied to falling into false advertising and people who played the game from the start thinking it'd be a fun nostalgia trip if they have any sort of problems around in-game purchases they can't play the game no longer and that's a real shame another issue to arrive recently in games are these live services Live services are games that are always online and you are expected to play them every day for bonuses. The most well known of these and quite old now is the 2004 World of Warcraft or WoW. WoW is a mass multiplayer online or an MMO that is still popular to this day being that it's one of the first most people have played so they've got the most time invested in it and it's easier just to stay on something you're invested in other than just moving to new stuff. Though it's a classic it still has problems such as you have to pay to have a subscription for the game and it's £10 every month. This is typical for a MMO like this to want people to pay monthly being that they have to maintain servers but in 2013 they added microtransactions such as pets that follow you around and help you in battle. With them adding more and more microtransactions, as of the 9th of January 2020, people are saying that with all the microtransactions, they don't see the need for the £10 a month to play the game, being that they are surely making enough money from microtransactions to run the servers now. World of Warcraft is a special case though, being that it's such an old game, we can still see these methods in two newer games. These games promote themselves as live services, these games being Fallout 76 and Anthem. Anthem released 22nd of February 2019 was a game that never should have been being that the developer, Bioware, typically makes role-playing games, so them making a mass multiplayer shooter was not what they're good at, and this was apparent when the game got released. It was buggy, broken and a mess, and from flops, with most of the new updates promised being cancelled and the development team being shrunken down so that more people can focus on the new game that should be coming out soon. Fallout 76 on the other hand was the same. It was released in 2018 and it was also buggy, broken and a mess. But luckily for the game, the developers stuck with it, unlike Anthem, fixing it up and making it more playable to the point that now it's still broken, buggy and a mess, but it's more fun to play for the most part. But like World of Warcraft, it has a subscription service called Fallout First, allowing the most requested feature of the game, private worlds and other stuff such as unlimited storage, this monthly subscription Though it's not needed to play the game like World of Warcraft, you still have to buy the base game for like 60 quid. Fallout first costs £12 for a month or £100 a year. If that's not bad enough, there were even problems when it originally got implemented, such as the private worlds you could buy not actually being private worlds at all allowing anyone on your friends list to join you and the unlimited storage if you put items in the storage container it just deleted them without any reasoning Fallout 76 also has premium currency called Atoms that costs £4.500. 500 Atoms can probably get you about one emote and one pose unless you get a repair kit. Fallout 76 is meant to be a survival game where it's realistic so your weapons break unless you spend time to fix them. But you buy Atoms, you can buy a repair kit that repairs your weapons with Without you actually having to do anything except for buy it. This from the community has been classed as a pay to win item that you can buy. Like Anthem, Fallout 76 was absolutely panned by reviews and the audience. These games were really the last straw for most people, being that they felt like rushed out catch grabs. Fallout 76 and Anthem were a turning point, being that it was hard to count them as actual games. But second quarter 
onwards of 2019 showed less and less loot boxes, life services and micro transactions. There were still some of course, Mario Kart Mobile and Crash Team Racing, but people are just not putting up with them anymore. To the point that in July, Grand Theft Auto 5 put a literal casino into their game to take the piss out of all the other games that hid it. NBA 2K20 showed a literal slot machine as a new way of unlocking players in the My Team trailer people were just not having it, leaving the video on YouTube with 194 likes to 9.3k dislikes. The difference between GTA and NBA way of doing it is that GTA is an 18 plus and a simulation of the real world, whereas NBA 2K20 is a 3 plus basketball game. It has no need for it to be in the game at all and making a trailer that shows it to an audience tired of seeing them is not a good idea. The biggest event combating microtransactions was when the UK Parliament brought forth Kerry Hopkins, Vice President of Legal and Government Affairs at EA to talk about the dangers of loot boxes. In this hearing, Kerry rebranded loot boxes to... So what we look at as, as surprise mechanics, um, but I think it's important to look at this. So uh, if, if, you go to, if you go to a, uh, I don't know what your version of Target is, but a, a store that sells a lot of toys, and you do a search for surprise toys, what you'll find is that this is something people enjoy, they enjoy surprises. And so it's, it's something that's been part of toys for years, whether it's Kinder Eggs or Hatchimals or LOL Surprise. I really disagree with this, being that you don't know what you're going to get in both of them, sure. But with a Kinder Egg, you get something physical, which is the toy that you can hold and play with. And unlike these surprise mechanics, even if you get something you've already got, you still have the chocolate you can eat. Needless to say, the UK Parliament didn't respond very well, even if EA do think. We do think the way that we have implemented these kind of mechanics, and, and FIFA of course is our big one, our FIFA Ultimate Team in our packs, is actually quite ethical and quite fun, enjoyable to people. But MPs found the industry was very reluctant to accept responsibility for intervening when a player was overspending or even to put a figure on how much was too much. And on September 12, 2019, the UK Parliament deemed loot boxes as predatory and a form of gambling, with MPs saying, Loot boxes are particularly lucrative for the game companies, but come at a high cost particularly for problem gamblers while exposing children to the potential harm. Buying a loot box is playing a game of charts, and it is high time the gambling laws caught up. We challenge the government to explain why loot boxes should be exempt from the gambling act. I believe that this is a good step in the right direction, being that laws can't be updated quick enough to combat the new ways that people can lose their money on seemingly harmless hobbies. Though they are still seen as bad, I think that the direction that it is going is a good one, being that the laws are going to change, being that publishers are getting away with a lot of bad stuff and we are seeing more of this on the news and how kids are spending thousands of their parents' money and those who make the game are just shrugging it off, doing nothing about it, or making games worse in the process, but they are changing it. You can see this in EA's latest Star Wars game, Jedi Fallen Order, being that it's fun, challenging, with a great story and has no microtransaction. The fact that it has microtransaction is a point in its favour, but it shouldn't have to be. It just shows how bad they were getting. But how have other people been affected by this and what do they think should happen to microtransactions? What are microtransactions? Oh, it's when EA go out of the way to ruin my gaming experience by putting a paywall in front of things that should be included in the base game. Um, like when you're playing an app and like you run out of lives and you pay like 90p to get five more lives or whatever. What do you think of microtransactions? Um, I think they're annoying and sometimes they're way too easy for people to do with the right information and it just leads to more problems that can possibly lead to online gambling. Um, I think they can be good in some situations, so like DLC microtransactions are good because you get like more content, but like loot boxes and ones where it's like 
pay to win um, can be quite dangerous, especially for like younger kids and things, because they might just see it as like a game. I, I play FIFA and I play against a lot of people that buy packs of cards, so it's when you have an in-game purchase. Uh, I think they're good if they're like only cosmetic and if they're kind of restrict gameplay then they shouldn't be, they shouldn't exist. I think they're a bit of a scam, like... It's all to do with gambling, so you never know what you're going to get. And then the ones you do know what you're going to get, they're really overpriced, so everyone wastes their money. Uh, have you ever purchased micro? Yes, for both. Uh, gold medics and restricted content, kind of. How, how much do you reckon you spent on it all together? <laughs> um, I'm not too sure. Uh, I'd say overall, across all games, maybe about 100 quid. Um, quite a lot um, in my life. Um, with like certain games, like cosmetic ones, where um, I'm quite like a big like completionist, so very much found it like quite addictive to like keep buying them to get like all the skins and like all the beef pieces and like finish everything 100% but apart from that I bought like DLC bits and stuff but I would never like get any like pay to win bits. No. 30 quid over the last couple of years but not really no. Several hundred pounds. <laughs> when it pops up that you need it to keep playing and stuff like that you know you better buy that DLC. You gotta buy, you gotta buy them, them skins. Be better than everyone else. Not a lot of them. There have definitely been um, apps and games that I've um, put a lot of money into. Um, I know people who have put thousands of pounds into games before because they're so addicted to the games and the game styles that that price every time is so minuscule that they don't think it adds up to a lot, but it really does. Um, I've definitely put a good amount of money into some games that I'm really into. It's just a nightmare. I don't buy microtransactions in like the pure sense in, in, in mobile games, but I buy DLC. I play Paradox games, so there's a few, few DLC there, maybe about 20 each game. What do you think should happen to microtransactions? I think they should like put laws on it, especially for younger kids. Um, you see like a lot of stories about children using like their parents' credit cards to buy Fortnite skins and things, and it's it's overall not good. Like I think if people want to buy like DLC and things and like story expansions, that's fine. But when it comes to like random randomly like generated bits, that's kind of technically like gambling. Um, they should like lock down a little bit. Kind of fine as they are. I mean. Maybe a limit on where the kids are allowed to do it because it's got the parents' money, but I think we're on the Uh Definitely should be kind of restricted and limited in some ways because um, I think it's, there's just too many of them um, at the moment. And it's kind of predatory, especially for kids and younger audiences. I think there should be a lot more security measures put in place so. Like, are you sure you can do this? And make sure it's the person who owns that account that actually uses that information so they can purchase it. Because kids can get hold of like their parents' credit cards or direct debits, and it's so easy to do. Um, just have more security in place, and if you're over a limit on a game, like especially spending-wise, then it stops you from spending that money for a period of time, just so you're not as addicted as to spending money if you have priorities at home. Well, I'd, I'd take the, the entire board of the A and I would, um, I'd ruin all that, actually. <laughs> I'd just put a paywall in front of each round of golf they play. I'd, I'd take their cars away and make them rent it each time. Just generally ruin their lives. Just disrupt, disrupting their daily. Come on, there you go. Um, I think as long as there's education about them, I don't think they're a massive harm for most people. I think people with addiction and, and gambling issues, I know some countries have banned, especially with FIFA, and purchasing of packs of cards on in Belgium, for example, that would more than completely. They should be more limited because of the gambling aspect, and anyone can do it, like on FIFA and that, so like, it's bad for kids. It says them more about the pack. And it's all scam. So that's it. From 2006 to 2019, from horse armour to loot boxes, microtransactions have changed so much in 14 years while taking advantage of a new medium to make as much money as possible. We've got to have money.
while the law is still lagging behind. Luckily though, while many well-known publishers and developers are making these predatory games, there has been other developers that have been making great games while this has been going on. Dark Souls, Persona 5, Witcher 3 and anything Nintendo does, they have no microtransactions in them and have not lost anything by not having them in. To me, this is how games should be. Sure, they have DLC for extra levels and missions, but you don't have to buy them to feel like you're getting your money's worth. I hope that this is how the game industry will end up with good games that you enjoy playing, getting more people back into gaming, creating better experiences for the people who actually enjoy playing these sort of games.